Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Glenn, uh, which all but a few people know me. It's actually kind of cool to do this uh, the second time in two days, but this time to a home crowd. Uh, I am really bad at doing presentations. I keep changing the slides, and I didn't rehearse this again since last night, so I've changed a bunch of stuff. So this is going to be rough, but you're all friends, so it's fine. <laughs> um, I am a freelance uh, web developer, but I also make screencasts for a living. Um, not quite for a living, that's why I still have to do freelancing. <laughs> but uh, if uh, Front End Center is the, is the screencast series I make and their front end tutorials. Uh, and having that as kind of a day job means that I have a fair bit of flexibility and a fair bit of time to explore things, explore problems that people are having and see if I can come up with new ideas. And in the last couple of years, I've really found myself doing a lot of CSS and uh, React stuff. So a couple of years ago, I was here presenting um, CSS modules, which if you don't know, it's a, a compiler for CSS, makes it a bit easier to work with at um, decent sized scale. And Style Components is a CSS and JavaScript library. Uh, React Snapshot is the new thing that I'm trying to push, um, which I'll just mention at the end because I think it's really cool. Nobody else cares about it yet. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's really, really cool. Um, maybe talk to me afterwards. Uh, this, you know, I just made that logo the other day. Um, I'm not sure about it, but. Um, Anyway, maybe talk to me about that. Um, the reason I bring those up is because they're all, um, they're all aimed in the same direction, right? They're aimed towards, they all build upon each other. They kind of, they either borrow ideas from each other, they borrow ideas from things that other people have made. They point in a direction. And so my talk today is about one of them in particular, Style Components, which um, is getting uh, pretty popular in the React community at the moment. And this idea of, that direction, what that road to unification is, um, what these all build towards, which is still um, a, a bit nebulous. It kind of comes under the umbrella at the moment on, of the thing called CSS and JS, which is uh, kind of was a dirty word for a little while, but it's quickly becoming something that people are really using. Um, I was going to talk a bunch about basic stuff about how CSS and JS isn't a threat to CSS knowledge and actually builds upon it and requires it. But Mark Dalgleish, another Melbourneian, um, wrote a better blog post than I can do. Um, this is uh, adapted from his talk that he gave in Berlin at CSS Conf EU, and it's fantastic. It's dispassionate, it's reasonable. It doesn't pretend that CSS is terrible. It doesn't pretend that JavaScript people know everything. It's just simply lists a bunch of stuff that is easier building on JavaScript instead of building on files, on the file system. Um, some of those benefits are here. Um, I'm not going to go through them. The point, the reason I wanted to bring them up was that these are not specific to a library. These are just part of the platform. If you build on JavaScript, if you build these ideas, you kind of get stuff like this for free. And it's really hard to build that stuff if you don't work from that foundation. There is one quote that I wanted to share, though, which is that, HTML, when we talk about sharing it online, and it's been for years now, it's not, just, um, it's, it's not just a React thing sharing components, but it's also JavaScript or jQuery widgets that generate you know, calendar pickets or something. We don't share bare pieces of HTML. We wrap them up in, in code. And CSS and JS uh, has a lot of the same kind of properties. And basically, we're talking about everything in JS, which is this idea of unification. right? It doesn't have to be JavaScript. It's going to be at the moment, because JavaScript's a thing that runs on the web. But with WebAssembly, it could be something totally different. But the idea is that there's, and I just fixed the typo like two seconds ago <laughs> in unification, because you know, don't never put the same word on the slide twice, because one of them will be misspelled. But I did fix it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, this idea, which is you could work in one environment, right? You could work in one environment with people with more engineering backgrounds and people with more design backgrounds could share uh, information, share code, share ideas. Uh, and you can also uh, unify the platform, which means one environment for development, but then you could target multiple devices, multiple platforms. Um, and I'll get through those. And I wanted to um, 
put this uh, talk tonight in terms of properties that get us towards one or the other of those two kind of goals. And so the first is the unification of skills and, and what I'm saying is, is about codifying best practices because really on a fundamental level or the, or the most basic level, a library simply enforces some pattern that you want to see everyone follow, which helps people who don't understand the reasons behind the pattern to use it by default because it's like you don't have to understand if you make it easier to do the right thing than the wrong thing, then everyone's going to do the right thing. And that starts with you know, a pattern that somebody you know, formalizes in a blog post and eventually finds itself in uh, a tool and gets kind of bedded into the community. And it's successful because it's beneficial. But fundamentally, it's about encoding or establishing these best practices. In UI, that change has come about as we've separated our concerns in a different dimension. Sort of instead of splitting along functional, sorry, instead of splitting along language lines, as we may have done in the past, we now separate across functional boundaries. We have individual components that may nest and may take others and they may share code, they may share properties, but the fundamental unit of composition is different in the kind of modern web, I suppose. And that's a pattern that's paying off. That's a pattern that's, that's helping people build um, software. The first time I saw that was at a talk at the first CSS conf, I think, by Nicholas Gallagher, and who just said, don't even worry about changing your patterns or your habits or whatever, just change your file structure. Just put the JavaScript for something next to the CSS of something. Put the SVG for something next to the CSS that requires it. Then you can use Gulp or SAS or something to compile all these things up, but this was the first step for me to being like, okay, here's the separations. And then that gets formalized by things like React and Webpack, right? So Webpack makes it easy for that CSS file to reference that SVG file, but then the build system understands those connections and carries through those dependencies. React makes it easier for those directories, those JavaScript files, to be first-class citizens that, that wrap up everything behind them. And it let you take code like this, which is a little dark, um, but code where it's a bunch of CSS living in a bunch of other CSS and a little bit of markup living in a bunch of other markup and convert it into the same CSS except imported by the JavaScript file at the bottom. It let you wrap a component that now had some property called text where you could generate out this unit of, of UI with this parameter text or prop text. And that was an you know, incremental step that in, kind of encoded that be best practice. CSS modules comes along and builds upon that. I'm just going to grab some water. <laughs> CSS modules basically says that previously the CSS that you were writing had to live in the global scope. You had to use names using something like BEM so they didn't collide. You had to have headline and headline underscore text because if you used words like text or H1 or something, then you might have a situation where lots of styles are applying to something and you don't know why. On the right-hand side, you can use words like wrapper and text, which are local to that file, and therefore don't have the same collision properties. Style components is very much the next sort of generation of these ideas. Style components, on the, on the left, we have our new documentation page that just launched a couple of weeks ago. On the right is the GitHub homepage. It's been going now for about a year. Um, it's been extremely popular. It's now used, I think it's now the most uh, widely used React styling library. Um, there's lots of activity. It's not just me, there's core contributors and lots of other people who contribute. Um, and it's uh, starting to really mature. The second release, which came out two weeks ago, added a whole lot of stuff that, to make it much more stable and um, kind of production ready. So if you haven't checked it out, now would be a good time. On the left, we have the CSS modules example from before, but on the right, now we have a single JavaScript file. Instead of having information across two files, we have the same information in one file. But we've tried to make it as similar as possible. So if you look at the words and you look at the lines of CSS, there's, there's almost a one-to-one -one mapping. The difference is the word header and h1 at the bottom have moved up to be kind of encapsulated in the styled element or styled component. Okay, so that's the sort of, that's the goal of style components. To basically be, to make it easy to do the same pattern that we were doing across JavaScript and CSS with CSS modules, but now do it in JavaScript. So the next kind of primary um, 
feature of, of style components and other languages is this idea that if you want to unify the whole development of UI, then you have to bring people along from different backgrounds. Um, I've got a question for people. Uh, how many people write SAS day to day? Okay. How many people write that version of SAS? Not the one with the squiggly brackets, but the one with all the white space sensitivity. Yeah, like two people, three people. <laughs> this is the dominant version of SAS, and it's SCSS was the it was its name, but now it's basically just called SAS because very few people use the other one. And it's such a superficial change. Previously, white space was sensitive, so you had to worry about things being indented, and it's very Python-like. And now it is a superset of CSS, so you could copy and paste CSS and then add little bits of dynamism. Um, you could add nesting and stuff gradually, one by one. It was much more approachable for anyone with a CSS background. But more than that, it said to people who knew CSS that he was something that met them half halfway. It tried to offer them a bunch of new stuff, but it didn't presume that they would just you know, be happy to just jump out and just say, OK, cool, I have to learn a new syntax. Because that is presumptuous. It is saying that, yeah, yeah, I know better than you. So much so that I'm going to tell you to take an upfront hit before you can get the benefits that I'm trying to sell you. CSS and JavaScript is doing the same thing at the moment. When I started working on style components, this was the best way that you could describe styles in JavaScript, which is this nested object syntax. The first couple of generations of CSS and JavaScript libraries didn't even do that. They were like inline styles. So you couldn't use pseudo selectors, you couldn't use media queries. You had to invent all different ways of doing that. And that's a huge barrier. Effectively, it's saying that those things weren't important in the first place. So anyone who's actually built UIs on the web for a long time and knows how important they are is like, well, you haven't really figured out you know, how to build UIs. Come back when you have. Now, you can do everything you can in CSS. This generates real CSS, not, um, and this is, sort of, this is not for one particular library. This is shared amongst a lot of them. But still, you have weird stuff. Like here, you can use you know, a bare value because there's no unit on a flex shorthand. And that just gets wrapped up in a string. But everywhere else, you need strings. Sometimes the selectors need uh, quotes around them because they're not valid things. Sometimes you need uh, camel casing instead of, uh, what is it, kebab case? <laughs> Delicious case. Um, and, yeah, and these are just JavaScript concepts. But they, and they are, like it is native JavaScript code, but it's, a, you know, it's a superficial barrier and it says to people, hey, you have to learn this before you can get any of the stuff that I want, you know, everyone to be using. Style components very deliberately try to copy SAS's syntax as much as possible and wherever it you know, makes sense to. So we take this block and it, we basically, um, we do some stuff that SAS does weirdly to make it more similar to SAS. The implementation of style components is massively Com uh, complicated by the fact that we do nesting and stuff and try to make it as similar to SAS as possible. But it means that if you understand SAS and you understand nesting, if you've been working with CSS for a while, style components should be much easier to pick up and start using. There may be certain optimizations that certain styles of CSS can't, you know, can't run on in the future where it's like, oh yeah, if you change your patterns a little bit, everything will run a bunch faster. That's fine. Progressive optimizations are fine. But as a baseline, I wanted to come up with a you know, feature parity, basically. Um, the next couple of points I'm going to make is, is around unifying the platform. It's about designing the library itself for the environment that you're going to be developing in. And this kind of almost goes, this is almost an, an opposite constraint to the one before, which is following the path of, the le of least resistance for the platform that you're targeting. So I've got an example here of one of the main kind of um, main APIs of style components, which is if you want two variants of something, if you want a button and a primary button, then instead of adding, a, adding an extra class like you might have done with HTML and CSS, you add this prop, which comes through as a little magic little interpolation thing that gets executed. And those, you know, those lines of code will appear on this one. And all of those will appear on both, giving you two variants of a button. And it's these sorts of things which require a little bit of upfront learning, but they map, they, they match the, what's easiest on React as closely as possible. We've, um, there's a few kind of branches of style components for different platforms, and they will have different APIs because they will try to match whatever's most native to the environment that they're targeting. And it's kind of trying to unify those two things, which is make this familiar as possible, except where there's something that's newer 
or easier. So we didn't re-implement variables or mix-ins from SAS. We just use JavaScript code. Now, if you don't know a lot of JavaScript, or if you haven't seen these new versions of uh, the ES6 JavaScript, this whole block is a multi-line string. And this little incantation means JavaScript, it means an interpolation of JavaScript, a little bit of code. And that can be a simple variable <coughs> over here. You can pull that um, variable down. Or it can be a function that gets executed, and so it gives you more power. And basically, these are a couple of little pieces of JavaScript con um, knowledge that you'll need to learn in order to use style components. But it then gives you an in into then writing more JavaScript and not having to learn a CSS or a SAS version of a loop or a SAS version of anything. Um, this is as close as we could get to, to kind of meeting both goals, I suppose. Um, and then the platform goes further, right? So we've started, we've hitched our cart to React, and that's been pretty good. Lots of people using React, and it seems to be pretty um, working out all right. Then something like React Native comes along, which lets you use the same constructs and target a new platform. And this is the first time I think I've seen it, uh, certainly for a web um, library to start breaking out and start like pushing the boundaries of what the code that you're writing will actually end up being run on. So it starts with React Native, and I don't actually, I don't know React Native too well, but because they're so similar, I was able to build the native version of style components very, very simple, very, very simply. React Native as a, as a team have tried to make everything as close to CSS as possible, even going so far as to re-implement the Flexbox layout algorithm, even though that doesn't exist in native. So you can say things like Flex1 and justify content, because those things are going to be familiar to you, and they're like an auto layout on iOS. And so that kind of effort to, to present a familiar interface, we just go one step further and make it look like CSS. Wrap it up and pass it through to um, these native components. Now, you can't use nesting because it doesn't exist in native, and there's some differences about the, the, um, the properties that you can use. But uh, generally, we try to make as many superficial uh, um, changes to make it as similar as possible. So then you can write uh, native apps using React and, and style components. But what's cool about this is that this code on the left-hand side is totally not specific to native code. That there's nothing in there that ties it to that device. That using this thing called a wrapper, and if a wrapper is a native component, then obviously that can only run on the on the device, but you can set it up so that you can have bunch, uh, several sections of your UI that are shared between a web version and a native version. It's just the individual pieces are divs on the web and views on native. Um, even Microsoft is getting in on the act, because Microsoft is getting in on all the acts at the moment. Um, <laughs> React XP, which is great, because they were like, what was the best version of Windows? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, React ME is going to be awful. Um, <laughs> uh, React XP is this library. I haven't really played with this much, but it's this library for building cross-platform apps, right? For building apps across web, iOS, Android, Windows, a new kind of platform, but it's all using React as this unification layer. Um, then there's this weird thing, which is React Sketch App, uh, written by John Gold at Airbnb, which uses Sketch's who knew Sketch had a JavaScript API, uses Sketch's JavaScript API um, that he obviously knew existed uh, to generate symbols inside Sketch so that you can define your pieces of UI in code. And then a designer can be testing those things, te like drawing them into real UI uh, elements and pr producing designs to, for feedback, but building off the same things that are driven with code that will then run on the web. Um, we don't do anything with this. I just thought it was cool. Uh, I've only got a minute left, and so I'm just going to finally finish with the kind of the downside of all this work. Was that it's really easy to add baggage. It's really easy to be like, oh, cool, all these things. Like, I'm just going to make everything in Webpack. I'm going to make everything in JavaScript. Everything's going to be great until you realize that JavaScript is quite slow to execute. And if you're shipping tons of JavaScript down, it's going to be super slow. I really like the fact that the Apple iPhone 5S or 5C, I can't quite read that, it's about one and a half seconds for, that's right, you know, friends of mine have got the 5C, right? This is a, not a particularly low power, it's not an emerging market phone. 
and a meg of JavaScript, which will gzip, you'll see it as about 250K. That'll take a second and a half to parse, let alone compile, let alone execute, let alone paint. And so you gotta be really careful of that stuff. The other thing is if you're not shipping real HTML, then when somebody uh, posts a link to something, so I made a, a really cool website called Pithy AF. It's, um, it's a demo, demo website where I just put quotes, quotes that I like by authors that I like. Uh, and I'm using it for a bunch of front end center episodes. And so if you po paste a link into Slack and it's all set up right with a static HTML with your meta tags, you get an image of the author, you get a little bit of the quote, you get an actual thing. Whereas if you just use React out of the box, you know, single page app, it renders the most default stuff, it gives you the nice big home page thing, it just tells you what the project is. And that to me is like the, uh, the, you know, the experience design falling over where if you're using a fast computer and fast internet all the time, you don't actually notice how big these JavaScript bundles are, but this stuff people notice. Uh, and I'm super running out of time, so I'm going to skip through this slide, which is basically that what it ends up happening is if you say, okay, cool, React is a bit slow and it takes some time and maybe it's not right for everything, so we'll do static HTML for all our marketing stuff and React for all the stuff past the login screen, you end up with this kind of division in labor, this division in your team, which is like we can't share assets, we can't even share knowledge, and we potentially don't uh, even share staff. And so if you're going to basically put everything into JavaScript, you'd need a strategy for rendering real HTML. You need to not give baggage to the people that you're now trying to bring in. You need to be equivalent. And so these three projects all try to do that. Uh, bet on JavaScript if you like, but always serve HTML. Um, so to conclude, the properties of whatever it is that we end up all using that just does everything, it's beautiful, it doesn't, you know, everyone can do it, everyone's happy, we all dance around in a circle, uh, is, is these four things. I think they're really important. You might not be interested in style components or React or any of that stuff, but these are the properties I think that will be, you know, that will pay off for the next, you know, several years. So that's me. Thanks a lot.